Welcome to this video in a series of lectures on chemical separations. In this video, we will be focusing primarily on extractions as a method of separating chemicals. During the course of this video, we're going to try to look at four major points. First, we're going to describe extractions and uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the process. And then we will go on to talk about different types of extractions and how we can classify them. Once we've completed that, we can look at the role of polarity of molecules and how it uh, comes into play during extraction processes. And finally, we'll look at how we can uh, express the efficiency of an extraction process mathematically uh, by computing a value known as the distribution coefficient. The first thing that we need to do is to define what an extraction is. And generally speaking, an extraction is going to be any process where you try to transfer a chemical from one matrix to another. So from one material to another material. Ideally, this transfer would take place in such a way that any impurities or undesired chemicals will remain in the initial matrix. Conversely, an extraction could also be very useful if the chemical that you desire remains in the initial matrix with all of the impurities being uh, transferred to the new matrix. One very straightforward and common example of an extraction would be the process of making tea. Um, as you can imagine, uh, tea is going to consist of several different components and I would argue that the average person would not be very interested in eating the entire contents of a tea bag uh, with the intentions of also consuming the desirable chemicals that are in there. So instead, what we do is we perform an extraction. We take the tea bag and we dip it into a cup of water that's hot. During the process, chemicals that are inside of the tea, the first matrix, are transferred into the water, which is going to be our new matrix. In this case, the desirable chemicals are being transferred out of the initial matrix, with the undesirable chemicals being left inside the matrix. When we make coffee, we're following a very similar process as in the case of making tea, um, where we are extracting the interesting chemicals, the useful chemicals, out of coffee uh, to consume, leaving the coffee grounds uh, behind. Again, uh, very rarely will you see somebody who's willing to eat coffee grounds uh, just to experience the, uh, the benefits of consuming coffee. What's interesting about coffee beans is that they can also be extracted in the other direction. In other words, extracted in such a way that the important chemicals or the desired chemicals are left inside of the coffee bean while the undesired chemical is removed. And by this I'm, I'm talking about the decaffeination of coffee. In order to remove caffeine from coffee, an extraction is performed where the beans are soaked in a solvent that is capable of removing the caffeine from those beans. The resulting product is a coffee bean that does not have caffeine in it. The desired chemicals remain in the initial matrix, whereas the undesired chemical in this case is being transferred to the new matrix, in this case that solvent that I spoke of earlier. It's important to note that both processes that I just described are extraction processes. Um, but one thing that should be uh, raising an alarm for you is the thought that if I take coffee beans and mix them with water, I get out all the good stuff. But if I mix it with a different chemical, I can take out the stuff that I don't want. And what this illustrates is that by choice of a solvent, uh, in terms of its polarity, uh, we can control which chemicals come out of the coffee bean. And likewise, we can use that to uh, control any type of extraction for that matter. The next thing we're going to look at is how we can classify extraction processes. Both the extraction of coffee beans and tea leaves are examples of solid liquid extractions. It's very important to recognize that the words solid and liquid have absolutely nothing to do with the material that's being extracted. Uh, 
those words are used to describe the matrices in which the, uh, the uh, chemical is being transferred from N2. So in the case of uh, making tea, uh, one of the matrices is the tea leaf itself, which is a solid. However, the extracting matrix was water, which is a liquid. Therefore, we call that a solid liquid extraction. The other most common type of extraction is a liquid liquid extraction. And we have not given an example of that just yet, but we will shortly. The only thing that I want to say about the difference between these two, aside from the obvious differences, is that liquid liquid extractions tend to be more efficient than solid liquid interactions. And that's mostly due to the fact that in a liquid solid or solid liquid extraction, it's difficult for the liquid to come into contact with all the internal parts of the solid that's being extracted. You'll see that when we start talking more about liquid liquid extractions, that there are, are a couple of tricks that we can play uh, to allow the two phases, the two matrices, to come into contact one, with one another to transfer the chemical of interest. You may remember from your general chemistry classes the concept of polarity. And the polarity of a compound is largely uh, determined by its shape and the type of bonds that are present in it. You may also remember that the polarity of a compound is going to largely dictate its solubility. Uh, one of the common sayings is that when it comes to solubility, like dissolves like. In other words, we would expect that a polar compound would dissolve in a polar solvent. Uh, also, that a nonpolar compound would dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. Now, once you get into organic chemistry, you'll understand some of the basic principles uh, that guide whether or not something is polar or nonpolar. But for the purposes of this course, I've made a list of several different solvents uh, and their classification in terms of polarity. Now, some of your most polar solvents are the ones that contain an OH bond. And this includes water, methanol, which is the simplest of all the alcohols, uh, ethanol, and acetic acid. We would expect these types of solvents to be able to dissolve some of the more polar compounds out there. First off, we would expect them to dissolve each other, uh, which is the case. But we would also expect them to, to dissolve um, other polar compounds, possibly even some ionic compounds, especially in the case of water. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have our less polar compounds. Things like hexane, ether, benzene, and toluene. These compounds are comprised mostly of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. And for this reason, have uh, rather greasy properties and behave a lot like oils. For this reason, we would expect uh, solvents in this category to dissolve more greasy compounds, things like oils, and to not dissolve ionic compounds or highly polar compounds. Most notably, we would expect them to not dissolve or mix um, with any of the solvents that are in the polar category. Now, in the middle, we have what I would classify as solvents of intermediate polarity. It's important to recognize that polarity is really a relative thing, um, with each compound or each solvent uh, displaying a different level of polarity. But the ones that kind of fall in the middle are things like ethyl acetate, acetone, or methylene chloride, or isopropyl alcohol. One of the things on this list that should kind of stick out for you would be the uh, presence of isopropyl alcohol. Because being an alcohol, we would expect it to be polar. But it turns out that as you start adding more carbons to an alcohol, it becomes or behaves less and less like an alcohol and more and more uh, like a greasy alkane. Solvents in this category tend to be a little bit more unpredictable in their ability to solvate things. Uh, for instance, acetone is going to be soluble in water, but it also dissolves a number of nonpolar compounds. The important thing to remember when doing a liquid-liquid extraction is that the two solvents that you use cannot be miscible in one another. In other words, we can't do an extraction where one solvent is ethanol and the other one is water, or we can't do an extraction where one solvent is hexane and the other one is ether. Typically, you will see extractions being performed uh, with solvents from, well, with one solvent from the most polar side and one solvent from the, the least polar side uh, to ensure that the two solvents do not uh, mix together during the extraction process. We should also note that when choosing an extracting solvent, uh, 
that the solvent we choose has a sufficient polarity to dissolve the compound that we're interested in. It does not necessarily have to uh, be a better solvent than the original solvent, um, but it does need to uh, be able to dissolve an appreciable amount of a compound that we're interested in. Now that we've looked at how the polarity of a solvent can affect an extraction, uh, let's now uh, explore how we can quantitatively describe the ability of a solvent to extract a compound from another solvent. And the way that we do that is by using a value known as the distribution coefficient. Uh, for our purposes, we will call this KD. Now you may recall from general chemistry that there were several different types of Ks that were important to us, KSP, KA, KW, but the one thing that all these Ks had in common is that they were equilibrium constants. And basically the K value was just a measure of the ratio of the concentration of the products uh, to the concentration of the reactants, with the idea being that K can act as an indicator of which direction an equilibrium was going to lie. So we can kind of compute uh, the position of equilibrium from the reaction. So let's say we have a given reaction where we have a concentration of X for the reactants and a concentration of X for the products, so the same concentration of both. We would expect for the equilibrium constant to be equal to 1. This also implies that when the equilibrium constant is greater than 1, the products will be favored because the top term will get larger. Whereas if the equilibrium constant is less than 1, we would expect the reactants to be favored because the, uh, the bottom value will get larger. Now parallels can be drawn between the equilibrium constant for a reaction and the equilibrium constant for uh, a, an extraction process by kind of looking at the extraction as sort of a chemical reaction. Uh, there's no chemical change really taking place, but we can say that some analyte is being transferred from an original solvent to an extracting solvent. And with that in mind, we can draw up a, an equation for our equi equilibrium constant. Now, we would expect that as the equilibrium constant increases, that we would be indicating that the extracting solvent has more of the analyte in it, and therefore it's a more powerful extracting solvent. But lower values of our equilibrium constant, our KD, indicates that we have a very weak extracting solvent. Now, to make the equation for KD a little bit more useful, we need to uh, be able to convert the units of concentration uh, to individual amounts of the analyte itself in the solvent that it's in. So we can look at the concentrations and let's, let's equate them to molarity. So we're looking at the molarity of the analyte in the extracting solvent over the molarity of the analyte in the original solvent. And by remembering that molarity is the number of moles divided by the number of liters, we can expand this equation a little bit further. Now let's apply this to a simple problem. Let's say that we have uh, a solution of some analyte A uh, that has been dissolved in water. And let's say that that solution is made up of 50 milliliters of water. So we have a solution of our analyte in 50 milliliters of water and we're extracting it with 50 milliliters of some kind of organic solvent. In this case I've chosen ether. ET203 is the uh, classic abbreviation for that. And let's say we do this extraction, and then after the extraction, uh, we analyze both of the layers, both of the solvents that were involved in the extraction. And what we can do is figure out how much of the analyte was in each one of the solvents. And let's just say that we found that uh, in the ether layer, there were 0 0.055 moles of the analyte found. And then when we look in the, uh, the aqueous solution and do an analysis for the analyte, uh, we'll find that approximately 0 0.045 moles of the analyte was left there. So let's try to compute the KD for this particular process. So we remember that KD <clears throat> is equal to the concentration of the analyte in the extracting solvent uh, 
divided by the concentration of the analyte in the original solvent. And what we can do here is plug in the values. At the end of the extraction, there were 0.055 moles of A in the extracting solvent, and there were 50 milliliters, which is the same as 0.05 liters in the extracting solvent. And then 0.045 moles of A were in the original solvent after the extraction took place, and there were 0.050 liters of the extracting solvent. And when we do this math, we wind up simplifying to 1.1 molar to over 0.9 molar, and because the concentrations are both in molarity, uh, those values are going to uh, cancel out. So please notice that the equilibrium constant here, the KD value, is dimensionless. There are no units. Furthermore, we can now make a statement by looking at the, uh, the magnitude of this number being 1.22 indicates a KD value that is greater than 1 and therefore the, uh, the extraction is actually going to be favored in the direction of the extracting solvent. In this video, we have examined some of the, uh, the basic principles uh, that control the extraction process, and we've also looked at how we can both qualify and quantify uh, whether or not an analyte is going to be more soluble in the original solvent or the extracting solvent. For the next video, we will look at um, some of the actual physical manipulations that must be carried out in order to perform an extraction. And we'll also talk about some tricks that are available to us in case uh, some problems arise. Thank you for watching this video.